So I think we're going to give uh, maybe everyone one more minute. I think we're supposed to start at 5.10. How is everyone today? It's almost the end of the day. By the way, is everyone speaking English? Because, yeah? OK, good. Um, I can speak Russian too, but my Russian level isn't that good. So if you have any questions, I'm, um, you can definitely address them in Russian. I'll understand that, but it's easier for me to answer in English. Okay, um, so I think we'll get started. Uh, thank you everyone for joining me today. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of things related to project management, but not only. Um, there's going to be a lot of tips and tricks and different tools and stuff that we use on a daily basis in our company. Um, also, um, I do have a surprise for you. Um, we're going to do a questions and answers session at the end of it, and we have some good Moldavian wine. So um, think about some good questions, and then depending on you know what we get at the end, you may receive a present that you take home, and hopefully you'll like the wine as well. Um, OK, so uh, let's get started. First of all, um, I th who here is a project manager? Okay, um, who's a QA, maybe? Okay, developers? Okay, so we have a mix of different roles, and um, when we work at an agency or you know, different product companies, we all get to interact in the daily work that we do. Um, project managers are usually people facing the clients and you know, coordinating all the different work, and when it comes to explaining people what you do or the assumption that they have of what you do, Perception can be very different. So, you know, you think you're doing one thing, your friends think you're doing a completely different thing. The team that you're working with sometimes thinks you're too hard and harsh with them. And then at the end of the day, sometimes what you do in reality is that you face a lot of challenges, try to resolve them, and try to get things moving. So that's why one of the quotes that I actually like is that being a project manager is easy. It's like riding a bike, except the bike is on fire, you're on fire, and you're in hell. So hopefully, at the end of the presentation today, um, you'll get some tips home that will help you stay away from the hell area um, and will help you make your projects better. Um, a little bit about, um, and by the way, yeah. So we're just going to make, um, we're going to learn more about getting things done without making excuses. And hopefully that will help you uh, reach your results and goals faster. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a project manager at FFW. Maybe you've heard about us. Um, we're a global agency with about 400 employees all around the world. Um, and I've been a project manager for more than six years. So um, that's why I'm sharing some of the experience and things that I've learned across this big amount of time. Um, okay, so moving forward, um, usually like everyone, when you're starting a project, you go through the typical project life cycles, which are the discovery and strategy, planning, creative development um, and deployment, and then the continuous development, which is like maintaining the process and the project uh, and all the things related to that. So today we're going to discuss about tools that we use in the different phases of work that hopefully will help you um, get better at what you're doing. So if we start with the initial uh, planning of the project, a couple of the tools that uh, we would usually use or different companies may do it as well um, are Smartsheet, Microsoft Project, Spreadsheets, Gunter, and Roadmap. Um, I personally really like Smartsheets. Um, they actually really um, recently redesigned their interface a little bit, and it's even better to use it. Um, and what I like Smartsheet for is the fact that you can do timelines for projects, have your tasks. Um, I have a screenshot coming up a little bit later, and I'll show you an example of that. Uh, but basically, you can um, do a high-level planning of the activities that you're going to have in a project and actually go for them and have a timeline presented for the client, too. Um, so Gunter for Drive um, is actually a free extension that you can enable with your Google account, which is very similar to how Smartsheet works. Um, 
there's a couple of issues that I've noticed when I've used it in the past. Um, you cannot really have dependency of tasks. Um, if you move things around, sometimes they can get funky in their behavior. Um, so that's why, you know, smart shit is my go-to. Um, Microsoft Project is a very um, corporate tool that a lot of companies use. Um, and spreadsheets are actually the tool that you can use to do anything you want, however you want. So if any of the tools available on the market don't fit your uh, use case, you can customize a spreadsheet and present the information there how you want it to look. Um, the downside of that is that it can take a lot of time to maintain it and to update it over time. So if you want to invest in that, definitely go ahead, but be aware that there may be tools on the market that are already doing what you may be building by yourself. So um, Roadmap is um, you know, doing something very similar to the other tools. Feel free to explore that too. Uh, for resource planning, what we use in our company um, is Float, Tempo, um, and Spreadsheet. We've used this at different points in times, and we use, may use it for different projects. So uh, Float is just a nice visual UI where you have all of your team members, and you can book them on different projects and see their allocation based on um, different times. Tempo and uh, Jira, because Jira is the task management tool that we use at the company level for all the things related to our project, having the resource planning in there is very easy because you have one spot to see everything in terms of time logging, um, you know, team booking an allocation, and then managing all of the tasks. Um, Tempo is an add-on in Jira, and if you have a lot of users, it may cost a lot. So it's something that you may need to look at investing, um, and if it's worth for your company to do that or not, depending on the priorities. Spreadsheets, you know, just customize them however you want. Um, this is the screenshot, by the way, that I was referring to regarding to Smartsheet. Um, so you can see here that you can plan things based on the sprint. You can have the start, the end dates, assignees. You can add a lot more columns of information. You can add the dependencies of tasks, so that something cannot start be, um, until a task is finalized. And then you have the Gunter presentation here with the timeline and all the things uh, related to that. Here's how Gunter looks. So it's very similar. You can see the layout is basically the same. Um, in terms of the spreadsheet, this is one example for how we do the high-level planning. It's very different compared to the previous examples in the fact that with a spreadsheet, we usually don't get very detailed into the tasks because based on our practice, we've realized that it would take too much time to maintain everything. So we just try to concentrate things on a very high level so that there's visibility in the maybe phases of the project that we have or a bigger group of tasks. And then we try to color code things so that it's easier to um, either track the progress or see what phase of the project we are referring to. This is a very old example of sprint <laughs> planning that we were doing. And um, Alvina here that um, also worked with us is familiar with it. So back in the days, we were using this type of spreadsheet to do sprint planning. So we would have uh, different tasks here. We would color code what's the progress of the task. We would even have like status here in percentages. Um, it's, you know, an alternative tool and something that you can use. Um, you know, what I think is the best is trying different ways of maybe um, doing the same thing and sticking with the one that works the best for you because um, whatever brings you to result faster and what is better for you to use is something that you'll do on a long-term basis. Okay, so for creative uh, work and, you know, once you've done a little bit of planning, you're ready to start some of the design wireframe work, there's a couple of tools that we use uh, on a daily basis in our company. Uh, first of all, I think back in the day, people were using Photoshop a lot for doing web design. Uh, right now, the trend is, of course, to use Sketch because it's better for the web. Um, it's more oriented towards having a, a component type of um, you know, designing the, the work and the pages that you do. You have a lot of components that you reuse on different pages. Um, 
there's a couple of things that I find, you know, a little bit troublesome in some cases. It's not supported in all the operating systems, at least back when I checked it. Uh, but overall, like, everyone is using it. And if it's not supported on all the operating systems, there are extensions and other tools that help you export what you have in Sketch so that you view it on the web. Um, one of those tools is actually Envision. There's another tool called Zeppelin that I will talk about shortly. So Envision, um, you know, once our designers have produced the work in Sketch, they would upload it to Envision. And that's the tool where we um, bring the client and all the team together to actually receive their feedback. Um, it's very good as a UI tool. The clients usually don't have any issues um, interacting with it because it's very user friendly. And they would leave comments in there when they have different feedback to share or items that they would like to get updated. We would receive that, we take care of it, update it, and then we do different iterations in there. Uh, one of the tools that is very useful in Envision is that it also has a code inspect tool. So the front end development team can actually go in there and see all the properties for different web elements without needing to have the files locally and without doing a lot of the you know, processes that were done in the past. So everything is basically sharing a link, they go there, they have all the details and they can just do the work. Um, very similar to how the inspect tool in Envision works is actually the Zeppelin tool. So you would upload um, the sketch files there or basically have a synchronization done. Um, and it does the same thing. You can see all the um, like font styles, font families, and all the properties that you would need to do the front end development work. Um, these tools are also very useful for QA processes because Again, back in the day, people would need to either have screenshots or have the uh, file downloaded locally so that they could check all the different properties if they do manual testing. Um, right now, things are a lot easier. We just share it and they just go and see all the information in one spot. Um, similar to those, by the way, you can also explore Macau, Webflow, Google Web Designer. They all do very similar things. The differences with most of these tools is pricing and the other, you know, like small tweaks and features that they offer. Okay, so when it comes to defining tasks, there's a couple of tools that we use um, on a more regular basis. The first tool that we use for interacting with our clients and for defining some of the things is Basecamp, of course. Who here is familiar with Basecamp? Okay. <laughs> Uh, that sounds good. So, um, are you using the Basecamp 2 or the Basecamp 3 version? 3, both? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so we usually um, add our clients um, in Basecamp 3 as team members. And we do a lot of the communication there. We try to stay away of emails at all way possible because there's issues with using emails. If you have to forward information to other team members afterwards, it can get very complicated. Um, sharing the history of the project is not useful when you have emails, but having Basecamp there um, and just providing access to someone via an email is very easy, and they receive access to absolutely everything that has been going on in the project. It's also, um, you know, a good way to store the information in one place. So you don't have to go through different email channels and try to understand what is going on. Um, Asana is a tool that has a very good UI and I would actually compare this to a combination of Basecamp um, and maybe Smartsheet because the recent, um, in the ways Asana has developed recently is that they have to-do lists, they also have conversations that you can start similar to Basecamp and they have a Gunter uh, view that you can have for the tasks as well. So depending on what you like, um, and again, depending on the pricing and what you're looking at having as tools, um, that may be something that you explore. Uh, Jira is something that we use for all the development tasks. So we track everything there and I'll uh, share a couple of details for how we set up our Jira and you know, how we track things there. Um, and Google Drive is usually the place where all the project documentation is on. So Basecamp is usually the point where we clarify details, but once they are approved uh, based on different meetings or conversations that are happening, uh, if we want to finalize something, we would store it in the Google document and then it has one unique place where everything lives. 
Okay, so project specifications. Uh, this is, I think, one of the challenges of doing maybe projects correctly and making sure that you're staying within the scope and within the budget of the project as well as timelines. Um, so usually, uh, maybe you've had the experience when um, you've had different expectations or the client has had different expectations of what they will be receiving at the end of the project and what the team has developed. So to avoid all the things related to that, um, a couple of years back, <laughs> we started to uh, do more detailed project specifications. And um, up until we have those approved by the client, we usually don't really do any implementation in the project because we want to avoid specifically that case when they wanted to have something, but we understood something completely different. And then the client can get angry, uh, you know, we will need to redo a lot of work. So it's a lose-lose situation for both parts. Um, Given that, we try to invest a little bit more time into setting the expectations correctly from the start, clarifying all the details, and then implementing the work. So um, one of the recommendations that I have regarding specifications is that because we work mostly with Drupal and this is a Drupal camp, um, in a lot of the cases when you'll have to do different things, you have a visual component of what you need to implement. So, Specifications are better done when you have a wireframe or a design because you have a visual presentation of how things can look. So the discussion can be more structured about, you know, you have an element presented here. What exactly are you expecting to have when you click this button? Uh, what is the behavior that should be present there? So in our specifications, we try to do um, user specifications as well as technical specifications. And I'll explain how, how that is accomplished in just a minute. Um, okay. Uh, one of the things that we do when um, it comes to Drupal, because we work with content types, pages, and all the things related to that, we try to structure our project documentation and specifications based on those um, examples. So we would define all the content types that we have in a project, all the different pages, uh, with the different components that we have there, and like if you have a news listing page, what exactly are you going to have on it? Um, general elements like the paragraphs, the header, the footer, and other things that are reused across all the pages on the site. Um, and we have a technical um, section where we would usually uh, put uh, the details of uh, user roles, the workflows, the content moderation details, any migration, um, any third-party integration, and other things related to that. Um, and one of the other things that usually creates discussions is what are the pages that are going to be on the site and having the assumption that, you know, the client wants 25 pages, you designed five pages, and then there's a gap between <laughs> your expectation and what you actually have in the uh, scope of work that you're going to deliver for the project. So we usually try to do a sitemap file where we ask the client to list absolutely all the pages that they want to have on the site. And then we have a discussion and try to map what page is used for what and what are their expectations based on it. If it doesn't fit the SOW, that's a different discussion, <laughs> but at least we try to get an understanding of what they are expecting. Um, this is how a sitemap would look like, and uh, my recommendation for this is that uh, this is like a second step in the sitemap discussion, because when you just start a project, the client may not be familiar with um, Drupal or some other technical details that may be required for us to actually implement something. So maybe as a first step, you do something a little bit more visual, which is like um, a hierarchy where you have a uh, where you may use something like Lucid Chart to have a diagram of the sitemap. But then um, what we found of better usage um, in terms of the implementation is to have a spreadsheet like this. And the reason for having it is because uh, we can add here a lot more details that we wouldn't really have in a visual diagram. So um, we have things here grouped by section. So we have the global navigation, the main menu, and then we have all of the items that go for them. We also have the links for all the pages. This is, um, again, an important conversation to have, especially if you have different URL patterns 
that need to apply for different content types. You need to store somewhere what are those patterns that you need to apply for the nodes. Um, if you have different designs used for different pages, uh, this is where we would map the page layout or design that applies to all of them. So it's basically like a one spot where you see a lot of the information of all the pages that you have on the site, uh, what is the design for all of them, what is the link for them, how do you navigate to all the different pages, and you have a lot of clarity regarding the scope of the project and what's the end sitemap that you'll need to have. Okay, so a little bit about content type specification. This is where we combine the technical as well as the um, functional specifications. So we would have, um, you know, like this is a press release content type example. We would have details like the title, category field, date, teaser body copy. And then we have a screenshot of how this looks like as a view mode. And then the definition of what are the details contained in there. Um, the other stuff that we would add is the URL pattern, if this has meta tags or not, if it's included in the sitemap or not, if it's indexed in the search, and basically documenting all the little details that maybe at the end of the day can be assumptions that people make, but then you know, if you don't track them, it's a hard conversation to have sometimes. For a page, we would have something similar to this. Uh, where uh, we have, again, the design or the wireframe, and then we have all the details for how this should work. So in this case, you know, this is a view. We have like 12 elements, and then we have a paginator appearing. So we're basically describing absolutely all the details that we see on the page and having a description for what is expected to be the interaction when you see all of those or when you click on them or all the details related to that, so that we avoid any unclarities or mis misunderstandings moving forward. Um, this is just an example for the content migration spreadsheet, uh, where we would map what is the source data, what is the destination data, and kind of mapping all the fields one to one, depending on the case. So we say that, you know, if we're importing um, some press releases from an external source, this is the content type structure that we have on the site, and this is where the data is going exactly. So again, this is something the client reviews, we confirm, and then we actually get to implement. Um, any questions so far before we talk a little bit more about JIRA? <laughs> no? Yep. A lot of um, tools, mm -hmm. but most of the um, companies use Jira or, or uh, Redmine. Mm -hmm. And these systems has plugins that cover ev everything. Why do you use different tools? Uh, sure, I'll explain why. Um, the reason why we use different tools is the fact that um, clients may not always be familiar with JIRA, and sometimes we don't necessarily want them to be in JIRA. Uh, JIRA is a very technical-oriented tool, and when you have clients that don't have experience with it, they have a learning curve, um, learning it and understanding how to interact with JIRA. So that's why using a tool like Basecamp is a lot easier for them. And when you have different stakeholders that do not need to be involved in all, all the day-to-day -day tasks that the development team is doing, they don't have any value in being in JIRA. They just want to be there for the high-level conversations and deciding what needs to be done in a project and what are the priorities compared to seeing and monitoring how the tasks get to be implemented. So that's why, because you have different business people involved in a project usually, um, you get to decide what uh, you use depending on what fits the client better. Yep, and one more. Mm -hmm. The Zeppelin app, app, application, it, it, is, it is good, but um, it, for, for designers, it is really easy to change the design and to not tell others. Yes, uh, really and easy. that is an issue and, sometimes. And sometimes they just create new folders, like new design, design from some, some date, design sprint mm -hmm. six. Yeah, and, so this and is. And it is hell. 
<laughs> I, I definitely agree with that. This is uh, something that needs to be decided interna internally uh, when you collaborate with different teams. So you have to establish this as an internal process and say, okay guys, to make things easier, here's how we would like things to be done. Um, usually we ask our uh, creative team when they do changes to always update Zeppelin as well. Uh, because we, we wouldn't, as you've mentioned, we, we, we wouldn't know that there have been any changes. Um, but usually the project manager that tracks things and how they are done would also keep an eye on that and double check if this has been done or not. So it's uh, a commitment that every team member needs to understand that they need to do. Because depending on how you do your job, um, that defines the team's success as well. So it's important that everyone contributes and understands that uploading the designs to Zeppelin is an important thing to do because otherwise, you know, other things get behind and then we all are delayed in the project delivery. So it's a commitment and it's a communication issue and stuff that needs to be um, coordinated internally. Hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, one question. Uh, yeah. As usual, during the development process, we have uh, we have the conversations with uh, the client. It mm -hmm. can be uh, weekly meetings, or probably can be uh, the meeting in the end of sprint. And as usual, client have some uh, remarks, uh, questions, etc. Uh, my question is, uh, which uh, software or maybe another method you are using for tracking the questions uh, for from mm -hmm. client uh, in the end of uh, weekly meeting or probably uh, sprint meeting. Okay, so if you don't mind, I will um, explain that a little bit more. I do have a um, slide where we discuss about capturing sprint feedback. So when we get to that, I will also answer this question. Okay. Um, We'll move forward with JIRA because um, we don't have a lot of time left. So uh, usually we use Scrum projects. Uh, we have a custom workflow that uh, we have set up for our tasks. Um, and uh, I really like using components in JIRA. I'll explain why in a minute. But basically, if who here is using JIRA? Let's start with that. OK. Um, Redmine? OK. Um, we've used Redmine in the past. I personally like Jira better because there's um, a lot more things that you can do with it. Um, okay, so I'll show you how we uh, have set it up um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So uh, what I would use on a daily basis with Jira is that I have a board that is built like this and um, this is a sprint view for all the tasks that we have in a project. So you can see here that we have a couple of columns. Uh, this is to do, in progress, needs integration, resolved, tested, and done. Um, I believe to do and in progress are pretty uh, clear in terms of their statuses of work. Uh, needs integration is a, if you're using GitHub, um, when the developer creates a pull request, uh, this is when the task is transitioned here. Basically, it means that they have done their part of the work, but it needs to be reviewed by another developer um, so that the code is approved. This is how we uh, track this in JIRA. Uh, once the pull request is merged, it means that um, you know, the code has been approved by a developer and it has been tested by our QA, so it's good to go forward on the dev environment. Um, it would be moved to resolved and then you know, tested and done. So that's kind of the process that you see in this uh, visual presentation of the tasks. So from open to in progress to needs integration or resolved, if it's, you know, if it's not a code related task, it would just go straight to resolved. And then you either reopen, test, close, or back to in progress. So um, we didn't have this from the start. Again, we like have done it over the time. <laughs> Um, and this is how things would look like in uh, JIRA in terms of uh, having information about the pull requests and in GitHub specifically. So there's a couple of things where we track the progress both in JIRA as well as GitHub. And this is the, um, uh, where the usage of labels in GitHub uh, comes in. 
um, are you, like, who here is not familiar with GitHub? Okay, that sounds good. Um, so if you're using labels there, uh, kudos for you. Uh, I really like them to um, designate the task statuses. And basically what it means is that when the task is being moved to the needs integration column in JIRA, uh, there's two steps that need to happen in the workflow that I work with usually. Uh, that is, uh, the task needs to be code reviewed and it needs to be QA tested. So if our QA determines that the task is not ready, they would add the label needs work. And then it means that the developer will need to take another look and uh, see what's wrong there. It is a more lengthy process, but um, we didn't really find a way to synchronize this in JIRA and have a better way for monitoring it. Um, so that's how we do it. Um, and then we have sometimes the label do not merge, um, which is important. Uh, okay, so very quickly, um, we won't stop to discuss more about this. Um, we use Google Drive, I already mentioned why. Box is more corporate. Um, some of our clients do it, and sometimes you may be, um, you know, uh, legally bind to using it as well because th there may be security reasons for you to do that. Uh, I don't, haven't really heard about anyone using Dropbox recently in terms of uh, collaboration for uh, the projects that we do, but it's an option. Uh, communication tools, Zoom, GoToMeeting, and WebEx. WebEx is more corporate. GoToMeeting is what we use. Uh, Zoom is great because it has a free version. Uh, all of them have basically the same functionalities. The prices are different. Um, WebEx has a limitation sometimes that you can uh, dial in by phone only and you cannot use a web version depending on the package that a company has. Um, and with Zoom, the free version has a 40-minute limitation for recording. So it's great to use if you don't want to invest in something, but it has a limitation. Um, okay, communication tools. We already talked a little bit more about this, so we won't uh, stop and do that. Um, in our daily collaboration with the team, as well as clients, we use Slack a lot. Um, so uh, here's, uh, you know, like another tool that we use, but there are differences in using this versus Basecamp. Uh, with a lot of our clients, we try to transition to Slack for very quick communication that we may need to do. So Basecamp is a place where we store a lot of the communication, but Slack is a, question, is a tool where we can address a question or give them a reminder like, hey, we're looking forward to receiving some feedback on this. Can you please follow up? Um, so versus doing that via an email, we can do it via Slack. Um, okay. So this is the question um, or the slide addressing the question that you had, which is gathering testing feedback, which um, in our case usually happens at the end of the sprint, which is where we demo the functionality that was done. Uh, we show everything to the client. We give them some time to go and do the testing by themselves. And then we ask them to uh, provide their feedback to us. And depending on the client and how familiar they are with different tools, there's uh, these three options that we have mostly used. So Jira, uh, if we have them in there, or if we're using the client Jira, or if we decide that we um, you know, will invest in having this client in, in Jira, because it does cost more when you have more users. Um, again, you know, we discussed that uh, it may require additional training for them. Um, so we do that. Um, the reason for using Jira is that they can discuss as a team and they can add the issues or any uh, feedback that they want to share in Jira. We get to process it afterwards and we get to decide um, if we're going to solve a task or if maybe they misunderstood how to, like, let's say, create a news item or do some of the other things. Uh, Basecamp is, again, a little bit easier sometimes for them to use. We can use a to-do list uh, where they add different issues that they may have spotted. And then the project manager would usually go through, uh, refine that list, and uh, transition into JIRA all the items that need to be fixed or you know, explain that um, you need to take some extra steps to do some of the other things. Um, and then we have a spreadsheet that we sometimes use for some of our clients, which uh, looks like this. So um, the spreadsheet is a place where a lot more people can contribute. Sometimes uh, they may have um, 
different marketing people that may test the pages that we would be doing, but they don't necessarily need to be involved on Basecamp or any of the communication happening there. So uh, we could share a spreadsheet like this where they document all the issues that they see and then we get to communicate with them. We usually color code them. Um, so we have like in progress, resolved, rejected by the client, cannot reproduce and some other stuff. Um, and some of the other columns that are included in that spreadsheet are, um, you know, like on the previous screen we had the issue summary as to what was wrong with it. Um, and then we have the steps to reproduce, the priority, what's the expected result, the actual result, a screenshot, OS version and browser version. Um, it may take a lengthy time for them to um, initially start using this and also completing it for every sprint. Um, we have found it useful with some of our clients to use this versus Jira. Again, depending on how familiar they are with the tool. Um, yep, and here we have just a couple of other tools that I wanted to uh, recommend. They're not related to anything with project management exactly, um, and mostly maybe you've heard or seen about them. Browser Stack is great for testing uh, on different browser and OS versions when you don't have physical devices. Backtrack is great for monitoring visual regression issues. Um, so you can compare the same pages on production and stage and you can see what's different about them. It will spot the places. TunnelBear is a great VPN tool that you can use if you have content uh, that varies depending on the location. Uh, Jink, Fireshot, and Snagit are great for capturing screenshots and sharing those. The Great Suspender is actually a tool that I really like because um, I usually have a lot of uh, browser windows and tabs open in them, so that takes a lot of resources. What the Great Suspender does is that it um, locks the tabs you're not using, so it's better for your computer performance. Session Body is a, uh, another Chrome extension that will save all the tabs that you have, and if your browser crashes, uh, there's a very easy way to um, open them up. And you can save different sessions and title them at different points in time, so you can navigate back in history um, and reopen different tabs. Uh, GoGL for shortening. Linkify for Jira. Uh, it's very useful because it auto-converts all the project key and task IDs into links that go directly to Jira. So you don't have to, if you have something like, um, I don't know, project dash one, two, three, that gets converted into a link and you quickly go to the Jira project and to the task. So it's very useful. And then you always need some lorem ipsum text uh, when you do testing. Okay, so that's basically the end of it. Um, probably we have a couple more minutes for some other questions. And you know, as mentioned, the best recommendation that I can give you is to um, explore different options, try to see what works for you, and then um, you know, try to do that and use it for the future. Thank you, and um, I'm happy to hear other questions. Anything else? Yep. Thank you for presentation. Uh, one question for me. So, what do you? Why do you use like Hangouts and Meet and uh, other uh, communication tools together? So, what is the difference between Hangouts and Zoom, for example? Yeah. Um, sure, that's a good question. So, uh, we would use Hangouts. We use Zoom, GoToMeeting, and WebEx mostly for um, the client meetings because you can set up a meeting time and the link that always stays the same. However, for team communication, when we need to do things a lot easier, opening uh, Zoom or GoToMeeting or something else may take a little bit more time. And especially if we don't need recording of the meeting, we wouldn't generally use those. Uh, we would use uh, Slack calling and uh, Hangouts. Sometimes there may be issues with the microphone in Slack, so that's why we would use Hangouts. Um, a while back, Slack also didn't have the screen sharing, so that's why we would use Hangouts, uh, which we would uh, turn on from Slack very easily, um, and we would do the screen sharing there. So, again, uh, 
these things change over time and what we were using three years back may no longer be relevant to what we're using today because the products are evolving and they are providing very similar functionality to other tools. Um, so you just, usually um, they would build their product and so that they um, tie you in more <laughs> and then you get to use more of that stuff. So. Um, I have, yeah, yeah sorry. Okay, okay. Uh, small question regarding uh, Basecamp. Mm -hmm. uh, have you had a chance to take feedback from your client on using this? Because as usual, clients are very busy people, and uh, as usual as I know, they even uh, can't have enough time to mail you with some short feedback. But using an additional tool, it could be some like waste of <laughs> their time. Like, uh, yes, uh, we've had different experiences with different clients and with using Basecamp. Um, it can be a challenge sometimes. Um, some clients prefer to not use it. So we've had a client that wanted to use Asana instead of Basecamp because they thought that fits their use case better. Um, you have to discuss with them and adapt um, and see what works better. Usually, we, we try to promote the idea of using Basecamp, but if the client insists on not wanting to use it, there's really nothing that you can do. You have to be aware of the client relationship and see how you can do to handle that better um, and not exactly force them to use a tool that won't be productive. So sometimes you have to bend a little bit to you know, fit some of their requirements. Yeah, thank you for the answer. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, and um, I guess uh, I, I'll give the uh, bottle of wines to the more active uh, people that, answer, that asked questions. So these are the, the two guys that we have over here. Um, and then um, I'll give one to the lady if that's okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Hopefully you'll enjoy the wine. And I'll see you downstairs at the closing ceremony. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, sure. Like this? Let's go to downstairs and have conference closing. Don't forget to have this bands on your hands in order to get to the after party. Bye-bye. Uh,